Hey everyone, Anthony Gazenza here with the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast and CincyJungle.com. Just wanted to preemptively say that we're very sorry about last night, especially to our live listeners and those especially on Facebook. We pushed back the recording time a couple of times. I know there were some that were kept expecting us to go live. However, uh, just kind of some personal stuff popped up and uh, we had to push back the recording time a little bit. But we went live, and unfortunately, Facebook failed on us late last night. So those who were expecting to see this on Facebook, we're sorry, but we're going to bring it to you. Still giving you coverage of rounds two and three of the NFL draft and what the Bengals did. Hope you enjoy it, and we'll bring you more over the weekend to close out the NFL draft. Thanks. Good to see everybody. Uh, apparently, uh, we've had some technical issues and we've started late. And <laughs> here we are now. It's late Friday night. I'm very tired, guys. I'm very tired. I apologize. It is late, I'm sure, for many of you. It is late for me here, but we are finishing the second round of uh, the second night of the NFL draft, rather. And the Bengals made two very, very controversial, interesting, whatever kind of uh picks you want to call them they made two picks and a trade on friday night so um it you can see it in my face it's been, it's been a long couple of days but it's been good I, again what i was saying before the technical issues it's been uh I, I want to apologize to our live listeners because apparently there's some issues with connecting to our facebook account and we had to push this back a couple of couple of times on Friday night because of some personal scheduling issues. And I just want to make sure that, uh, want to make sure that nobody's upset that we had to move it back a couple of times. I apologize, but didn't mean to leave anybody hanging, especially in the live viewing part. But at any rate, we are here. It is late for many of us tuning in live, but we're going to, we're going to talk about the things that the Bengals did on Friday night addressed the trenches did the Bengals on Friday night. And I, I guess this is kind of a little bit of what we assumed they would do go offensive line, go defensive line, particularly a guard slash tackle and an edge rusher. The Bengals did both. Now there are mixed reviews, particularly with their second round pick. And then of course you get, you get into their, um, their third round selection, and I think a lot of people feel that there is a lot of value there. We'll see how everybody takes that pick. I know there's there's some mixed opinions about that, but let's talk about that. The Bengals in round two, they select Jackson Carmen, the offensive tackle out of Clemson. Now, this was a guy that was talked about a little bit, and credit to a few people here. James Rapine of All Bengals and Sports Illustrated had, a, had an article, I think, up on Friday and uh, maybe even Thursday a little bit talking about the interest level of the Bengals in this player. And then, of course, my co-host John Sheeran on our Listener Questions Live episode a little bit earlier today talked. He kind of made a little bold prediction that that was going to be a guy that the Bengals pick. He said initially second round, and I said, really? Maybe not third round? And he said, no, no, no. I, I, I mean, maybe third round, but he was kind of going bold and saying, hey, second round is where I see the Bengals potentially going with, with with this pick. So look, there's what, what this is, is a, a, an uber athletic kid, especially for his size, a five-star recruit and a player that, you know, really Clemson at a young age, Clemson, a, a perennial national championship type of powerhouse team entrusted him to protect the blind side of Trevor Lawrence, a number one pick, and obviously a, a very, very important player to what Clemson was doing. So look, here's, here's what I like about it. I like the upside. I like the, the profile that the Bengals keep utilizing, which is draft a young guy, get them while they're on the upswing in terms of reaching potential. Let's develop them. 
and get them to reach that potential that we see there out of this player. They did it with T. Higgins. They're doing it with Jamar Chase. Now Jackson Carmen's another one. They tried to do it. It hasn't been working out with Michael Jordan at a very young age. And, and Jackson Carmen fits that mold a, a, a quite a bit there. Now, th- there are some questions as to where he fits. What's the short-term versus long-term? And, of course, is how high is the floor? Because here's, here's the thing with the offensive line and the Cincinnati Bengals in this draft class. They needed, and this is why I was particularly enamored with a guy like Liam Eichenberg, because I felt like the ceiling was pretty high for that player, but I felt like the floor was also pretty high for that player. Whether you played him at guard, whether you played him at tackle, it felt like there was a relatively high floor with that player. And, you know, he went a few picks before the Bengals went on the clock after their trade. Now, here's here's what I liked about this pick. Aside from the athletic profile, the size, and the ability, the, the versatility of being able to, hey, you know, let, let's put Carmen in there at right guard or at least let him compete for that starting right guard position that seems to be open at this point in time, groom him to be a right tackle potentially, and then see, let the chips fall where they may right? And hope that the Frank Pollock effect, the Zach Taylor effect, the offensive scheme that they have will work well with the attributes that Carmen has on, on film. And here, he, this is the tricky thing. As you listened after the pick, whether it was on ESPN or NFL Network, I particularly watched ESPN and Booger McFarlane was raving about the Carmen's ability to move at his size, which is in the 320 pound range, you know, six, five, a a really, really big guy and a guy that can move very, very well for his size per reports and things that you see on film. But you know, there, there is some tech, there are some technique issues. There are some things to be cleaned up for Jackson Carmen, especially whether you're looking at him as a guard or a future right tackle. Now, I think initially a guard, as you're trying to develop those things, you can hide or mask some of those things that you're trying to to coach up. But um, you know, you, you got to hope that Frank Pollock is going to work his magic with with a player like this. What I also like about that, aside from the age, the athletic profile, even though there was not specific testing, because, and we'll get to this in the negatives, because of some medical issues what I like about it. This seems to be a player that for better, or for worse, Zach Taylor, Duke Tobin and company targeted and they strategically targeted this player in the second round, but they felt, and there are some specific quotes here. They felt that, Hey, if we're looking at this kid at 38, we can move back a bit, especially with there not being an offensive line run at that moment in time. We can move back, collect some more picks, still get the guy we want and get some picks, even though they're day three picks. And I know that fourth round picks aren't necessarily a premium. We'll talk about that in just a second. But we can get a couple of picks and, and do some things on day three that will also help our roster potentially. So, and this is this is kind of a little bit of an MO. We talked on this program and on Cincy Jungle and other outlets where the Bengals like to move back often in round two, especially in recent history, because what they, they target a specific player that has first round traits, but they think that, hey, you know, if we're picking in the early middle part of the second round, we can move back, collect a pick, get the player we want, and have picks later at our disposal. It happened with Joe Mixon, happened with Jesse Bates, and it happened again tonight with with Jackson Carmen. This is a guy that Frank Paul, Zach Taylor, and company said, we want this kid. We like this kid. And because of the age, because of the athletic profile and everything, they really, really like this kid. Now, if you listen to the talking, the national media talking heads – Mel Kuyper, who I love, 
Mel Kuyper and others, they had maybe more of a third round grade, a fourth round grade on Jackson Carmen because not only was this tape a little inconsistent and there, there still are great flashes of athleticism, the ability to protect a, a blue chip type of quarterback, all of that. Where does he fit? He's got the shorter arms, right? I think he's in the 33 inch area. So shorter arms. Is he just a long-term guard? Can you mold him into a tackle? We'll see. But he also underwent, I believe, back surgery. There are some back issues with this young man. And that is something that scares off a lot of teams. It's what causes certain players with first round traits to fall to the second round, the third round, etc. And that's inevitably what happened here. Now, so there, there are some folks that believe he still could have been had in the third round, maybe even the fourth round. Who knows? There are some other players that I, I, I think I saw that Jalen Mayfield's still available. That's a player that a lot of people thought, hey, you know, second round might be even late for a player like that. And here we go into day three, and certain players are available that everybody was certain was going to be gone at that point. So, um, yeah, John says Mel didn't like uh, Mel didn't like the Carmen pick. No, he did not. Um, he, he explicitly said that he thought he was a a round three guy at best. But the Bengals feel that this is a guard slash tackle, and even if they view him as a long term guard, this is a guy who played at a a high level college program against stiff competition and even if even if the entire idea all along is always going to be guard 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 for Jackson Carmen he could play tackle in a pinch if there's an injury or something like that so I I, I tend to believe that the overarching blueprint with this is let's let him compete at right guard right away and groom him to be Riley Reef's replacement in a year, two years, that sort of thing. I, will it work out? I don't know. This is probably one of those boomer bust things, which, by the way, that's kind of what you use the second round pick for. A lot of these guys in the second round are boomer bust type of players because they have a lot of first round boxes checked in terms of traits, in terms of film, in terms of in terms of all of that. But there's also either a box that is not checked. There is a box that it's a negative that is checked, that sort of thing. And that's why they're available in the second round. That's why they're available in the third round, that sort of thing. So in terms of Jackson Carmen, I think that uh, I, I really, I'm not absolutely in love with the pick because there were a lot of offensive linemen that I liked at the time, whether it was at 38 or the picks that followed when the, when the Bengals moved back that I think could have come in and suited the team well, but the team, its staff targeted this kid. They wanted this kid. And so you have to give them credit for them to get the guy that they want, move back and collect more picks. You have to like that. We're going to get to Joseph Asai in just a second. Another another really, really intriguing player. And perhaps um, in terms of value, you know, one of the better value picks in the draft. I want to say this. When it comes to the additional fourth round picks, I, I thought maybe, you know, you have, you have, I guess now three fourth round picks. If you're the Cincinnati Bengals, maybe you package those up and move back into the third round. They didn't do that. <clears throat> Now what you do, though, on Saturday. By the way, this has kind of become a little theme in terms of multiple fourth-round picks in the Zach Taylor era. They, they like to collect that, collect the, the picks in that round and, and get players that they feel that can help them right away. By the way, I, I am very impressed with the amount of live listeners. We, we've got a limited amount of platforms that we are streaming to right now. Facebook is letting us down. We are still streaming to Twitter and YouTube and it is 11 PM Pacific 
and 2 a.m. Eastern, and God knows what other time it is everywhere else, and we still got a lot of people tuning in live, and I appreciate that so much. Thank you so much, guys. And again, I apologize for the keep the, the continuous pushback in terms of when we went live, but uh, some things popped up, some personal things, but there were good things. Unfortunately, it, it kind of sacrificed some things with the show, but I appreciate all of you tuning in live. And if you were unable to join us live, I apologize for the scheduling snafu on Friday, but thank you for listening afterward. I appreciate it. I, I want to say this before we transition to Joseph Asai. Actually, let's go here. I'm going to share something real quick. This is on bangles.com. Apparently, someone named Willie Anderson. Have you heard of this guy, Willie Anderson? Uh, apparently, Willie Anderson was consulted somehow by the Cincinnati Bengals about Jackson Carmen. And he vouched for the young man. So if you look here, when Tobin asked Anderson if he thought the six foot five, three hundred thirty pound Carmen could come in and compete right away, Anderson said he felt he could. That call came twenty five years after the Bengals called him at number ten overall. At six foot five, three hundred thirty pounds, Anderson calls Garmin Carmen a guard right tackle type. Very intelligent, high football IQ, said Anderson, who could have been talking about his twenty one year old self. So Willie Anderson was consulted about this kid. Obviously, Jackson Carmen was a player that the Cincinnati Bengals had been kicking around as a name for to help them out on day two. This was the plan all along seemed to be, hey, let's let's get these big school guys. Let's get some of the best players on these big schools at positions of need. Wide receiver, we're going Jamar Chase, LSU, national champion. We're going to go Jackson Carmen from Clemson, a guy who played in national championship games and blocked for the blind side of Trevor Lawrence. By the way, LeVar Hollis, 3 a.m. Bermuda. You are a champ, my man. You are a champ for tuning in live. Um, look, I mean – there are, I'm not going to sugarcoat this thing. There are warts when you watch the film on Jackson Carmen, but the upside is clear. The size and the movement skills for a guy who is 6'5, 330, you got to like that. And oh, by the way, Willie Anderson's vouched for him. Willie Anderson, it's not just some, you know, some retired Bengal who's kind of just, you know, sitting on the couch and not really doing much. Willie Anderson is actively coaching college athletes, high school athletes, namely offensive linemen, coaching them up to become pro ready. So I think he knows a thing or two, not only because he played and has a hall of fame resume, he played and, and coaches now young kids coming up in the high school ranks, the college ranks looking to go pro. And when the Cincinnati Bengals, I thought it was just interesting in general that Duke Tobin and company kind of said, Hey, you know, tell us about this kid. What do you think? We really, we, we really like this kid, but give us a, both an inside and outside perspective. Tell us what you think. <clears throat> and Willie Anderson said, Hey, you know, I, I, I think if you're looking for an interior offensive lineman, maybe someone you can groom at a right tackle. This is a guy that, this is the guy that, uh, you know, you guys should be looking at if you're looking at second round, third round. Some people believe the Bengals may have reached. That that could be possible, but they reached by grab by grabbing two extra picks. So you have to kind of look at it that way. And and so this kind of like the chase, what I was saying with the chase pick the night before, you can grade this pick, but it's also kind of an incomplete grade. Because the chase pick, you can say, oh, A, F. C, whatever, because it's based upon if the Bengals maybe get some offensive line help on night two, namely round two. They did that. So now you could say, okay, well, maybe now Chase is, you bump that grade up if you had a low grade on it. I didn't. But 
you look at this pick and you say, okay, well, gosh, this was maybe a little bit of a reach. Okay, well, what do they do with the other two picks that they got from it? Yeah, Outf- Outfit underscore Boss here says, like I said, three picks in the fourth round. What do they do with that? We're going to talk about Joseph Asai in a second. <clears throat> The four, the three picks in the fourth round. I think you look at defensive interior. Unfortunately, Milton Williams. Uh, I, I, from what I gathered, he. Uh, I, I got to catch up on all the picks and stuff. Milton Williams is gone, but <clears throat> a guy I like. I know I'm the USC homer. Jay Tufele still available. Defensive interior. Bobby Brown. I. I, I got to check and see what his status is, but uh, you know that's a name to kick around there and. Um, you know, there, there are some defensive interior players who can help them out. And, uh, yeah, the, the other – there's two USC defensive linemen that could help them out potentially. But those are a couple there. What about wide receiver? Could they double dip at wide receiver? You know, we wondered, you know, with three free agents gone out of that position group at wide receiver – they only really replaced one now with Jamar Chase. Is this now the time that the Bengals kind of load up at, at some of these guys on day three at wide receiver? Again, I go to USC, Amon Ross, St. Brown, but there are some others that intrigue me as well at, at other from other schools. Um, you know, there's there's kind of your I, I think Chaz Surratt and others that are kind of lingering out there that may be round four, round five, but kind of some guys that can round out your wide receiver group. And with a limited number of picks, it's kind of like, okay, we've got these needs. How, how do we do this? How do, how do we get all of the players that we want and need at these specific position groups with only a limited amount of picks at our disposal? And now with those two extra picks, they can do a lot of different things. And I think defensive interior, a second offensive lineman, and a second wide receiver is definitely on the table for discussion. There are some other great offensive linemen, some high-quality offensive linemen. I think uh, Trey Smith of Tennessee is still out there. Now, granted, he is a true, true guard. So, you know, you, you got to take that for what you want. What about tight end? What about tight end? You know, I think Brevin Jordan's still available. Um, is that, you know, project guy? Is that is that a position you want to invest in? I don't know. But the, the point is, is that the Bengals have a little bit more room room to play on day three, so to speak, and get some of these positions that seem to be deficient of, of talent. And that's what this trade was about. You got the guy in a lot of eyes. You got the guy that you wanted. And, and a lot of people thought, hey, second round's a little too rich. Okay, well, whatever. Because second round's too rich, we really like the guy for our system. We like the size. We like the athleticism. We like the age. We like the overall athletic profile. We'll groom him. But we'll move back, and we'll get a couple of picks, and we'll still get the guy we want. And, and you know, day three, we can we can make some, make some moves here with, you know, the extra picks that we picked up. So uh, in that respect, I like it. I think they're, they're, this may be a little bit longer term of a project than I personally would like in terms of Jackson Carmen on the offensive line, but we'll see exactly what, what the plans are there. <clears throat> Let's transition to Joseph Asai. I thought that this was a really, really, if you thought the Bengals reached in round in round two rather and got a guy that you know maybe would have been there <laughs> it's almost like some people would have been like hey why don't you swap these two picks here but the point is is <clears throat> the Bengals got both of these guys and they uh they got a couple picks in the trade so if you look at um, i'm looking at some stats here 11 and a half sacks over three seasons. Now, not eye-popping numbers. Kind of did some different things with Texas. He was technically a linebacker for them, but put his hand in the dirt quite a bit. But you look at those stats, and, and you know, really as a freshman, seven games played, 
only one true full season, 13 games in 2019, and then you've got the nine games last year. Really, though, you look at the 11 and a half sacks, but he had uh, 30 tackles for loss, did Osai. So when you uh, – <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> been talking a lot these past couple of days. I apologize. My, uh, my throat's a little dry here. But when you look at that, 30 tackles for loss in total, 11 and a half sacks – over three seasons, really impressive. Ninety total tackles in 2019. So this isn't a guy. And the question is, and why he lasted in the third round is, what do you do with him? What do you where do you play him? What's the position? And is he an every down player at this point in time? I, I think we would all say no. Joseph Asai is not an every down defensive player coming into the league here. But the point is that Osai can bring you rotational pass rush right away. Osai can maybe develop into a guy that can play in space a little bit, given his size. But you have to really, really like um, <clears throat> the length. Now, I know that he doesn't, have prototypical weight, prototypical size, all that, all that kind of thing for a true edge defender in the NFL, but he's got the length that a lot of teams covet. And that is something that you can't coach up. You know, we're talking about arm length so much on the offensive line, but you know, on the defensive line, it's a trait that <clears throat> is is something to also be valued. I'm trying to look up here. Uh, the my one of my favorite favorite accounts, Kentley Platt at Math Bomb, to look at it. But basically, Joseph Asai's athletic relative athletic profile is uh, is pretty high. Uh, he didn't do some of the agility drills, but I think he ran a, a little bit over four six in the forty yard dash, and <clears throat> you know played showed up pretty well in some of the workouts there. So this was this was more of a value pick, and the Bengals like to go linebacker, tweener, what have you in the third round. They they've tended to go that route over the past couple of years. Really, I mean, going all the way back into a lot of years in, in the Marvin Lewis era. So. This is a pick that makes a lot of sense, and I think this helps the Bengals' defense out a lot. This may take Ryan Kerrigan out of the picture. Ryan Kerrigan may have been out of the picture anyway, but um, you know, I know they they flirted with him, and then you know, I, I think everybody was kind of seeing where the chips fell there. <clears throat> so it may take Ryan Kerrigan fully out of the picture there, but this is a guy that brings rotational pass rush. This is the guy that gives you know, versatility up front in that, you know, you sign Trey uh, Hendrickson, you have Sam Hubbard, maybe some of those guys kick inside and you can bring this young man in on the occasional third down, obvious passing down off the edge. And you can just kind of generate pass rush from a lot of different areas. That's what Lou Anarumo has attempted to find in his, in his, his now third off season, third year with the club, he has attempted to build a defense wherein they can find pass rush from a lot of different areas. Now, injuries have hurt them. Some poor free agency signings have hurt them. And now some miss outs on free agency, right? I mean, if you look at all of the defensive interior players that they pursued, especially this offseason and ones that are the of, of the mold of getting after the quarterback, penetrating into the backfield often, kind of the, the more smaller, almost Geno Atkins-ish type of profile. <clears throat> you know, they pursued a lot of those guys, and they either didn't get them or, you know, they did get Larry Ogunjobi, who's, who's a, an effective player. But, it, look, the point is they're trying to generate pass rush from a lot of different areas on defense – this is a young man who can who can help them do that. I think it's a very great 
value pick for the team. I think that he can, uh, I, I don't know how effective he will be right away, but I think it's more of a role player, a rotational player, maybe molds into a, a more consistent quote unquote starter or, or player along the defense defensive line. And then, you know, who knows, maybe you can mold him a little bit to play in space a bit, but I, I think this is all about edge rush and the Bengals need that after losing Carl Lawson. Yeah, they got Hendrickson, but they needed a third guy to come in and be able to rotate with those guys and make some plays. So uh, look, I, I, I don't know what grade I, I, I again, I, I don't know what grade I would give the three picks so far. You know, I, I've been asked, what do you, what do you like? What grades would you give each of these picks? It's almost, it's almost a domino effect, right? Like I said, like Jamar Chase has, you would say, I want to give this a high grade, but I need to see if and when they address the offensive line on night two. They did that, but that's another player where you go, okay, so you move back, you get this guy. Some people feel it's a reach. Some people feel like it's a project, but the talent is there. What do you do with the picks that you netted by moving back? And if you're able to get some interior defensive line help, maybe another wide receiver, maybe another edge rusher, maybe a tight end, any of those that come in and are able to help you right away. Um, I don't know. I don't know. So uh, a lot of people are saying, <laughs> uh, commenting on my eyes, guys, I am tired. I am tired. But I'm, I'm powering through it. I'm powering through it for you guys. So if you can make assumptions about certain things, that is not, <laughs> that's not what's happening. It's, it's fatigue and uh, a little bit of um, <laughs> doing a lot of podcasting. If you remember last night, we had about a three hour show. So the, the old, the old windpipe is, is struggling a little bit and I apologize, but I wanted to make sure to get with you all tonight after the Bengals make two very intriguing picks and ones that should help the team at, at some of their biggest positions of need. Look, you, say what you want. I know it, it seems as if round two has always been a little bit of a point of contention with a lot of fans in terms of value, who they grabbed, all that kind of stuff. But what what are their what were their biggest needs going into the draft weekend? Wide receiver edge rusher, offensive line. And with the limited amount of picks, you needed to get an offensive lineman who you feel could play guard and potentially develop into a tackle. Well, guess what? They got that guy. May not have been the ideal guy in fans' minds, in Mel Kuyper's minds, in other draft gurus' minds. But, I mean, it's a guy that they feel fits them well and has a high-end athletic profile. And that's... You gotta you gotta feel pretty good that they've taken a little bit of at least in their book best player available position of need and even even if it wasn't the best player available they were able to move back grab some picks help themselves out that way we'll see what they do in rounds four through seven we're gonna get with you more on those picks tomorrow we're going to talk about that i think we're going to try and do a collaboration show with the other cincy jungle podcasters we'll see what happens there kind of going on the fly a little bit this weekend as what happens with the draft because the Bengals trade they move they do all kinds of stuff the, the draft goes a bit longer sometimes and of course uh, some personal things pop up but i appreciate all of you who tuned in live I know there's some some difficulties tonight, and again, some of that is on my my end. I apologize for moving it back, but I appreciate it. But I wanted to talk about rounds two and three with you all. A couple of good picks for the Cincinnati Bengals to pair with Jamar Chase, and the Bengals are headed into a good direction with a lot of picks at their disposal on day three as they finish things up on Saturday. We'll see what they do. We'll break it down here. We'll break it down on cincyjungle.com. And we'll continue to bring you all the coverage for the 2021 NFL Draft. For Cincy Jungle, I'm Anthony Gazenza. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Go get some sleep. I know I'm going to. Take it easy.